Hi, um, today we're going to do 8.1, which is lines of evidence for evolution. Um, so you may hear people say that um, it's the theory of evolution, so it doesn't hold any weight, um, or that it's really just what some people think. But um, that comes from a misunderstanding of the word theory in science. Um, so you've heard a scientific law. This describes um, an observed pattern, but doesn't under doesn't explain or help you understand what's causing that pattern. The theory is the explanation. So a scientific law will usually be associated with a formula or possibly numbers or data. Um, and the theory may have formulas and numbers, but um, will also have language that helps explain um, what's going on with that data. Um, so this is just a little um, thing I found on the internet that helps describe the difference between theory and um, a scientific law, because there is, especially um, people who may have some conflict with religion and um, what their, the Bible says or some other work and um, what evolution is. So what is the difference between a theory and a law? So we're going to talk about the evidence for evolution. Um, there is molecular and genetic evidence. This wasn't around when Darwin first put forth the theory of evolution. And in general, the more closely related two species, the more similar their DNA. Now, if you look at the difference in DNA um, between humans and primates, primates it's very, very small. Um, less than 1%. So a lot of the genetic material we share with other organisms that are not even closely related. Um, also, there's something called a pseudogene. These are genes that no longer function, but are still in the genome. And these can act as a molecular clock. Um, so there is a known rate of mutation um, in DNA. And if you look at these pseudogenes, you'll find that they accrue more mutations the longer two species have been separated from a common ancestor. Um, so it's based on this rate of mutation, which is in fact known, and you'll find more mutations the longer that, you, that those two species were separated. So what is a pseudogene? And you can just click on an option. All right, and we've already talked about homeobox or Hox genes. Um, that help coordinate the body plans as um, we talked about before we left school. And we do share those Hox genes um, with lower organisms. Uh, and if you remember, we talked about how we go through the um, phases of evolution as we're gestating. So we have those gill slits and um, a tail and fins. Um, and it is one particular theory that thinks when you duplicate these Hox genes, this is how you can get changes um, to a body plan, how you can have mutations that occur. Um, because we, remember when we talked about chromosomal um, mutations, those large scale mutations, you can have duplication of um, multiple genes. And this can significantly alter a body plan. Um, so you can see, um, you can see this. This is a fruit fly, and you can see some of the similarities are color coded here. <clears throat> so there are similarities between humans and fruit flies, and you wouldn't think that they would be um, related at all. And here you have on a single chromosome, um, the similar um, Hox genes for the development of um, the vertebrae, the thoracic vertebrae, which is also similar, believe it or not, to a fruit fly thorax even though they don't have um, a vertebrae column, they still have uh, genes that help form their thorax. What does a Hox or homeobox gene do? All right, so it's hard to kind of separate the development and the Hox genes, but um, developmental similarities, which are caused by the Hox genes, are found in vertebrates during embryonic development. 
Um, and again, we had spoken about this before school let out. So you can see a fish, a human, a rabbit, all look pretty much the same. And then as you have different genes turned on, they diverge in their similarities. Just another picture. All right, so there's also anatomical evidence. Anatomical means um, relating to the body itself. Um, so this is a very important word, homologous structure. These are, um, and remember homo means one, these are variations that have come about due to a common ancestor. So an example would be the bones in a bat wing and the bones in your hand are the same. And that's true even for, if you look at a horse's leg and your hand, they're going to be similar. Uh, even a dolphin who's an aquatic mammal have the same bone, okay? So they're shaped differently, which can come from mutations, but they are still um, the same type of bone. Um, this change to the morphology of the anatomy proves that there, these differences are actually a result of mutations to the original body plan. So having an elongated uh, carpal bone, it's still a carpal bone. It still has the same fundamental structure and it's in relation to other bones, even though those other bon bones may have also changed shape. Now, different from a homologous structure is an analogous structure. Um, and you may have heard the word analogy. So if you wanna think of that, where you're trying to make a similarity bet between two things that are not actually similar. So analogous structures are those that come about because there's a common environment, a common need, um, such as bird wings and bug wings. They're not related, they don't have a common ancestor, um, but they serve to allow that organism to fly. So you don't see the basic similarity, even though the actual limb may be different that you see such an, as a dolphin fin or a human hand, um, like a bug wing and a bird wing have very different anatomy. So an analogous structure an example would be an insect ant leg and a horse leg. What do they do? They propel the organism forward, help it to walk. Um, they are not from a common ancestor. Uh, a fish fin and a dolphin fin. They both allow that organism to swim, but they don't come from a common ancestor. They're not, they're not made from the same material. They don't have the same basic uh, anatomy. Um, and another example is an insect wing and a chicken wing or any other bird. And then we have vestigial structures um, that are no longer used by a species, um, but do not negatively impact the organism and therefore are still present. Um, if there is a structure that's no longer used that somehow harms the organism, um, natural selection will kind of get rid of that. An example of a vestigial organ is the human appendix. Um, it's a cecum that still works in herbivores, but because we're not herbivores any longer, uh, we don't need them. Um, another example of a vestigial organ is the erector pili muscle. Uh, this is what actually makes you get goosebumps. Um, and another example that you saw in the video is the pelvis and leg bones of whales. They're still present in whales, but they're vestigial. They don't do anything. They're just kind of floating in there. There's your um, pelvic and leg bones. It's, it's actually kind of cool if you ever get, get to go to a museum. And we have a tailbone, right? And I will put this link here. It's um, some um, different variations of humans that are um, proof of evolution. They're, they're, they're basically vestigial organs. This type of structure arises from a shared environment. If you can answer now. 
this type of structure arises from a shared ancestry. This structure no longer functions and does not serve a purpose, but lacks evolutionary pressure to not have it. A bird wing and an insect wing are what type of structures? A whale fin and a human hand are what kind of structure? Goosebumps are what kind of structure? All right, now we also have geological evidence. Um, so there's the theory of uniformitarianism, which means that through history, the rate of sediment deposit is constant, it's not changing. Um, so we can use these layers to calculate how old um, a layer is. So fossils are preserved remains, Usually in sedimentary rock, um, I will include a link here if you're not sure. Uh, usually they cover this in middle school. This is how fossils can be made. Um, and so fossils aren't made everywhere. Um, if you have too, the conditions are too dry or um, not conducive to forming a fossil, you're not going to get a fossil. So those organisms that didn't live in areas conducive to fossilization, are not gonna have a really complete record of their evolution through time. Um, so the fossil record is um, incomplete. Uh, we find fossils even now um, that help us understand what occurred. We have better um, technology to help us find fossils. There are enough fossils, even though it's not complete, to show the evolution of many species. Um, and we're going to be watching a video next week about tetrapods, which are four-legged animals that talk about the evolution of these tetrapods. The fact that the rate of deposition of sediments is constant is called the theory of what? Cancer now. All right, then we have radiometric dating. So you may have heard that uh, some people actually still think this, that the earth was only 6,000 years old. Um, there are trees that are 6,000 years old. Um, we do know that the earth is 4.5 billion years old. Um, and we can find the, the, how old something is by radiometric dating, looking at different radioactive isotopes um, and their, how much has decomposed how much of that radioactive material has become non-radioactive. And we all contain radioactive material. It, uh, don't confuse radioactive material with radiation. They're not, they're not the same. So radiometric dating is the breakdown of an unstable isotope, which means it's radioactive, but it doesn't necessarily give off radi radiation. Um, certain elements have a very known amount of the unstable radioactive isotope in comparison to the stable isotope that's found in nature. Uh, one of the most famous ones is carbon-14. So if you know the percentage of carbon-14 in um, that's present in the environment, when something dies, it stops eating new food and uh, replenishing its uh, carbon-14 supply because the plants have also carbon-14. So the carbon-14 starts to degrade, it starts to decompose, and then um, it has a known half-life, which is 5,730 years. So as soon as something dies and stops eating, that carbon-14 begins to decrease in amount, in amount because it's not being replenished. So you can look at the amount of carbon-14 in an organism and determine how old it is. Now, carbon-14 is really only good for certain uh, time periods because its half-life is, you know, 5,700 and some odd years. So you can't use it for things that are really old because it will be too small of an amount to actually measure. And the half-life is the time it takes for the half, half of the sample to change into the non-radioactive isotope. You should have learned that in seventh grade, um, but if you didn't, um, there'll be a little link, a link to 
radioactive isotopes if you're really not getting this. So one of the good things about these um, radioactive isotopes, weather, heat, UV, radiation, don't change the rate of decay, it's constant. So carbon-14 can be used to date things um, about 10,000 years old. Uranium-238 and potassium-40 are used to date older things. Um, so rocks, and that's how we got a, an idea of how old the Earth is. And this is the um, video I was talking about. Carbon-14 is only used to date things that are how many years old or less. All right, so we're gonna do a few problems. All right, so suppose an organism has 100 grams of carbon-14 at the time of death. Approximately how much carbon-14 remains after 11,400 years? And the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. Right, so here's a formula that you can, why is it not working? Right here. So the A is equal to the final amount equals the initial amount times 0.5 or one half to the power of the time that has elapsed since the organism's death over the half-life. So let's do a problem because that will um, hopefully help you understand it. Now there's two ways to do this. You can do it algebraically if you're good in math. Um, you can use the formula or you can do it where you're just gonna calculate, you're gonna take half of the original amount until you get the number. So I'll show you um, both ways. So let's identify what these numbers are. The initial amount, A0, is gonna be 100 grams, right? And we know the time in green is 11,400 years and H is 5,730 years. So we're going to find how much C414 remains, which is A. This is pretty straightforward. Equals 100 grams times 0.5. Now you're gonna need a calculator um, with logs or with exponents to be able to do this. Um, so my time is 11,400 divided by five times three zero. Remember that's a exponent and that can be simplified to two. So then it becomes 100 times 0.5 squared and that's gonna equal 25 grams. Now, if you don't want to do the math, you can also look at how many half-lives passed, right? So that's going to be this number right here, how many half-lives passed. So you take the time, which is 11,400 years, and you divide it by 5730, and that's going to give you the number of half-lives, right? So I had half, uh, two half-lives. So then I started off with 100. The definition of a half-life is half of it is decomposed. So I go to 50, that's my first half-life. Then my second half-life, I go to 25. Okay. All right. Let's try another one. And this is in the slides as well. I'm just not going to switch back and forth. So similar problem. I have 20 grams, that's my initial amount. And the time are green. And my half-life is the same, it's 5,730. And you're just gonna set this up exactly the same way. So my final amount equals 20 times 0.5 and my exponent is 22,920 divided by 5,730 and you can you have to simplify this first this is going to be four and when you get that it will be using your calculator uh, 
1.25. Now, if you don't want to go through the math, you know that you start off with 20. You still have to find the number of half-lifes, which is four. So one half-life will bring you to 10. Second half-life will bring you to five. Third half-life will bring you to 2.5. And fourth half-life will be 1.25. Now, here's another problem. Um, this is a little more difficult. Um, you'd have to go into um, use a log for this if you want to do it mathematically. So I put the explanation in the slides if you want to go look at that, if you want to um, solve it algebraically, because here's what happens. What's my um, initial is 100. My final amount, right, A, is 12.5 grams and my time is 21.6 seconds okay so i'm not given my half life and you can see that's in the exponent so you would have to find you would set it up because like this 12.5 equals 100 times 0.5 21.6 divided by x so if you're gonna do this mathematically, just make that your X. And then when you find your X, you're going to actually um, figure out what it is, how many times that can 21.6 is divided by that. So you would have to find, because it's an exponent, you'd have to take the log of 0.5 and then solve for the X and the exponent. Um, I'm going to show you the way to do it that you don't have to do that because you might not have a calculator that allows um, exponents or logs. So I, I don't know what the half life is, but I know how much time expired. So I have to find how many, how much, how many half lives went past. So I know if I have 100, my first half-life is going to go to 50, my second half-life is going to go to 25, my third half-life is going to go to 12.5, and I can stop right there because that's the amount that I have. So I have three half-lives. And I know that 21.6 seconds expire, and three half-lives went through during that time. And then I'll get up. 7.2 seconds per half-life. And you can use that time of decay divided by the time of each half-life as just another example. All right. And those are just the problems. That's what I was telling you how to do it if you want to solve that mathematically. Um, and then there's one final thing that's in your book. The Archaeopteryx is um, the first bird or feathered dinosaur. So you may have been hearing that they think a lot more dinosaurs were actually feathered um, based on some fossils that they've been finding. Um, and there may be fossils that have yet to be discovered that will help understand um, whether the majority of these dinosaurs had um, feathers. So you know, what are some things that fossils can't tell us? Um, you may have been to a museum. What color were they? What did they look like? What did they sound like? How did they act? You know, um, so there's a lot of things that are missing um, in the fossil records that maybe someday can be solved by DNA analysis. 